Hi everyone and welcome to the Allied Air Force webinar for March. I would be obliged if you would turn your cameras and sound off until the presentation is over. It just helps to keep the background noise to a minimum so that everyone can enjoy the presentation and hopefully it will stop any delays or any screens freezing at the same time. Please pop a note into the chat box and tell us where you're watching from today. We like to know um, where our audience is, is um, in the world. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Claire Wilson and I will be your host this evening. I'm a professional genealogist for Treehouse Genealogy based in Central Scotland. Uh, I also run the Allied Air Force Research website where I work as a researcher and aviation historian. I was born into the RAF family and I suppose my own interest in this topic stemmed from researching many of my own Air Force relatives and probably like most of you that's uh, where the passion grew during this year we have been <laughs> oh, okay if we can just stay on mute everyone i would much appreciate it i'm to let someone else in sorry i'm trying to multitask today um where did i get to um yeah so i have an amazing range of speakers for you this year you can find out more about these talks via the website and I will post a link um, where you can check that out and register um, once we've, we've inter introduced our speaker for this evening. Um, if you take a moment to subscribe, we will also send you an email by the turn um, where you can register for all of this year's amazing events and we'll also keep you up to date as each event approaches as well. We also have a private Facebook group, which is also named Allied Air Force Research, and it's an amazing way um, to chat about your interests, what you're researching, regardless of the time period or trades, get some advice and also meet like minded people. I'll place a, place a link for that into the chat box as well. Um, if you follow me already, you'll know that I do have an amazing relationship with Pen and Sword Books. I'm currently working with them to produce some short interviews that can be included during our webinars. Um, they do stock an amazing range of aviation books and, and also genealogy books. I will post a link in the chat box of where you can check these out for yourself. Tonight's pre-recorded interview um, is with John Starkey on his book, The, Cro the RAF's Cross Channel Offensive. So stay tuned after tonight's presentation to catch that um, recording as well. Um, our speaker for this evening is Dr. Dan Allen, archivist for the International Bomber Command Centre Digital Archive. Since 2015, the IBCC's Digital Archive has recorded over 1,200 oral histories with veterans and survivors of the bombing war. And they've also digitised over 2,000 individual collections of veterans' letters diaries, logbooks and photographs. Many of these collections tell stories previously unheard by anyone outside of their own families. Tonight, Dan will explain how and why the archive was created and how it works. Um, and I do believe that he actually has, is going to highlight a few of the gems um, included in the, the archive and will show us how best to search it as well. Any questions for Dan can either be placed into the chat box or you can ask them at the end. Um, Dan, good evening. How are you? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was just said I'm on mute. I thought you'd muted me and then realised I could. <laughs> I did. I did. I muted everyone just to try and keep the background noise to a minimum at the beginning. But yeah, no, how are you? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm chiggity boo, as I used to say. Thanks very much for having me on. No, you're, we're glad to have you. Um, Bomber Command's close to my own heart, so I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Well, I'd like to say, well, to quote Spike Milligan, I've not rehearsed this because that way nothing can go wrong, but we'll we'll see how it goes. <laughs> no problem. I'll hand over to you, Dan. Okay, okay. So I have a PowerPoint. Um, da -da -da. From the beginning. Can you see that then, folks? I can, yeah. Brilliant. Um, is it is it from beginning? That's right, that's yeah. better, isn't it? Yeah. That's it now, yeah. So, well, you've kind of done that bit. That's me. I'm uh, the archivist for the IBCC Digital Archive. I have been since uh, 
2015. I was a volunteer before I uh, got a permanent gig um, with the archive and the university. Um, and before that, um, I was doing my PhD at the University of Warwick um, and my thesis examined the lives and emotions of Irks and WAFs in RAF Bomber Command. So ground personnel and, and what they went through. So that's that's my background. Um, was working as a, as a volunteer for the IBCC. The job came up as an archivist and curator for the exhibition um, about the same time I finished my PhD and I wasn't going to let anyone else have that job. So that was, that was my job. And that's what I've been doing for the last mm, eight years. Maths isn't my strong point, but I think it's eight years. Um, so what I thought I would talk about this evening is um, a bit of the background of the IBCC, uh, talk a bit about the losses database and the memorial, run through what you can see if you actually come to Lincoln and visit the, the centre and the exhibition, um, and then concentrate on the IBCC digital archive, which is what I'm chiefly working on now. Um, talk a little bit about you know, how we've done things and why we've done things the way we have, and probably most importantly, the last section of, of how to search the archive, um, because um, there's there's some people that seem to have issues with it. We're, we're doing our very best to make it as user friendly as we possibly can. Um, it does have quirks and foibles, but there are always workarounds and ways to get around things, um, which I will I will talk about um, later on. So the the history of the IBCC, it was. First, it was the idea of who was then the Lord Lieutenant of Lincolnshire, a chap called Tony Worth, um, who in 2009 thought it would be a good idea to have a memorial to all those who lost their lives uh, in Bomber Command flying from Lincolnshire. Um, Lincolnshire, since the late 70s, early 80s, has sort of been known as um, Bomber County. Of course, all the people in other counties would... would uh, dispute that, um, certainly Claire and Harry uh, and the 102 Squadron Association people are going to say, what about Yorkshire? And that's part of the part of the issue that we have. Um, the original idea was for to have to have a memorial in Lincolnshire for the bomber command losses who flew from Lincolnshire. Um, Tony was sort of approached approach the Bomber Command Association and people like that, and they, he was told to uh, put it on a back burner while they finish raising money for the Bomber Command Memorial in Green Park. Um, once uh, that was completed and unveiled, he then started again wanting to have his memorial in Lincolnshire and he came to the University of Lincoln to help him with um, a business plan. So the University of Lincoln got involved in 2013 with the project um, and my colleague, Professor Heather Hughes, uh, was a big part in this and the idea then sort of grew from being um, a memorial in Lincolnshire it was thought it would be better if it was a memorial to all those who lost their lives flying with Bomber Command and the name the International Bomber Command Centre um, was was created was thought of. Um, on my previous slide I had um, Remembrance, recognition, and reconciliation. Those are the three R's of the IBCC. Um, and a big part of this is to be inclusive and to tell everybody's story who was involved in the bombing war um, on both sides of the conflict, in the air and on the ground. Um, and it's international because you know the whole world was, was involved in, in the bombing war to one way or another. People from over 50 different nations came and served in Bomber Command. Um, and of course, the, you know, the, the bombing war spread throughout Europe and, um, and across to Japan. So um, the university then got involved. I got involved as a volunteer. Um, as I say, I was employed in 2015. Um, and after several attempts at, at getting lottery funding, um, the project was successful uh, in, in 2015. And the, the lottery fund paid for um, the creation of the digital archive and the exhibition that's at the centre. Um, the, the rules are they'd only pay for, for um, heritage and a new build, which is uh, what the building the IBCC is, doesn't count. So otherwise, we'd have had more of that. 
Um, so 2015, um, we got a small team together. There are only four of us who work uh, permanently at, in the archive. Um, everything else has been done by volunteers. Um, and in 2015, we trained lots of volunteers in how to do oral history interviews. And um, we sent them out all around the world um, to interview as many veterans as we could possibly find. Um, and of course, you know, this was heritage at risk because, um, you know, by definition, the, the veterans were in their then 80s and 90s and were, were dying out very, very quickly. So we we did everything we can just to gather as much information, as many interviews, as, as many collections as, as we possibly could. Um, but at the time, back in 2015 and 16, all we were doing was preserving this, this these interviews, recording the interviews and saving them on, uh, well, effectively we had hard drives, um, which we kept in different locations in case one went wrong and, um, and kept backing up. Um, and it wasn't until much later on that um, the lottery let us have the funding to get the hardware and the software and actually build, begin to build um, the digital archive that you can see now. Um, and yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the impact that had in, in, in a bit, probably. Um, and the centre opened in 2018 and the archive was launched in 2018. Um, at the start back then, not that long ago, um, we had about 2,000 items that were, were, that were public and people could search and, and look through. Um, now we're, we're, yeah, well, we're doing much, much better than that. Um, oh, and the other thing that's happened uh, recently, which is kind of good news, um, is the IBCC and the University of Lincoln have recently signed a 20 year partnership. So the, the, the project um, will carry on for the next, next 20 years at least. Um, which yeah, I think is, is pretty good news. Um, so if uh, you go to the centre, one of the things you will see is the is the memorial and the memorial walls. Um, and you can also search the losses database, which contains the names of all those who lost their lives flying the bomb command. Um, to try and you know, to try and meet these this idea of uh, inclusivity. Although the the, the tradition, traditional number, it's accepted that the number of losses of Bomber Command is uh, 55,523. That only includes, that's the air crew. Um, what the IBCC chose to do is to include everybody who lost their lives flying with Bomber Command, whether they were military or civilian, or whether they were ground personnel or WAFs. Um, and there are some scientists named in the lists and um, there are some nurses and journalists and all sorts of people. So um, our losses database currently um, has, well, the last time I looked, because we keep finding new people or, or finding we've made a mistake and somebody was fighter command or something. Uh, last time I looked, the figure was um, 57,512. Um, but we've also started to add in um pre and post war losses um for for bomber command um so like from 36 to the, the mid 60s i've forgotten the date historian i can't remember the date um so there's now actually 58,546 names on there um it's fairly intuitive to search the losses database um it has lots of different fields. The the first ones are you know are fairly obvious is um, surname and, and initials or, or first name, but there's a drop down and you can add date, service number, squadron, station, aircraft type, um, aircraft serial number, which is quite useful, um, and you can you can build up searches like that as well. So and and if you're looking for sort of vague fuzzy ideas, you can combine them. Um, in different ways and when you're searching dates if you click the little plus sign um, you can add a range so you know you can look for those who were lost in in March 43 or whatever um, the other thing the other way that helps is obviously with, with bomber command and people flying at night there's a takeoff day and a landing day and an operation might might spread across two days so it, it helps to be able to break it down like that 
Um, the memorial itself um, is a, is uh, a, the spire that sort of reflects the, the the spires that would have been on the cathedral, which you can see in the distance in that in that photograph. Um, it's 102 feet tall, which is the wingspan of a Lancaster. Um, again, this goes back to Tony Worth and it being a Lanc uh, Lincolnshire uh, Bomber Command Memorial. Um, Nicky Barr, the CEO of the IBCC, is very happy to say it's the tallest war memorial in the country. Of course, if they'd have uh, chosen the Halifax wingspan of the right mark, it would have been a foot taller. Um, again, a legacy for the way the project started. Um, the names, when you actually go and visit the, the site, um, the names are in two separate phases of, of concentric circles of, of, of names there. Um, and again, that's partly due to how the project started. So the first uh, first inner ring is one and five group and training command, which are the, largely the people who flew from Lincolnshire. And the second phase is um, the rest of Bomber Command. So four group, six group, three, eight, second, two tap, all of those. <clears throat> Just, uh, you know, just you, you might be looking for a particular name and you might think you found it, but there might be a, a, someone with the same name in the, in the second phase. If we have two J Smiths, um, they ha do have separate individual uh, names on the memorial and they're, you, can, you can discern them by um, the last three numbers of the, of the service number. Um, so that's a photograph of the centre shortly after it opened. Um, it, there's there's some nice sort of peaceful gardens and a few more additions to the front of the building now, um, but inside the centre um, there's a shop and a cafe, um, and an exhibition which uh, I curated with with the help of a few other people. Um, there's a three pound something parking charge and it costs about eight or nine pounds to go in the exhibition, but everything else is free. Um, the centre is called the Chadwick Centre. Again, that's a legacy from it being Lincolnshire on the command. Uh, of course, Roy Chadwick was the designer of the uh, of the Manchester and the and the Lancaster. So I think moving on to uh, the exhibition, um, this is what you, you one of the things you can see if you go inside uh, the centre. The exhibition is in three parts. It has three galleries. The first one is is downstairs and tells the story of the bombing war from a military perspective. Um, and this shows, the map is, is at uh, the end of one of the walls in the first gallery. This is a, a seven meter screen um, and on here is projected every single bombing operation from both sides of the war that we could find in the time available using published secondary sources. Um, it sort of breaks museum and exhibition rules in that um, when you when you start to put together an exhibition, you're told that people's attention spans are very short. And, uh, you should limit yourself to 150 words and nothing should last more than you know, two minutes. Um, this is an, is an animation based on the research that we did, which runs for 10 minutes and it shows the entire uh, bombing war. Um, and it does work. I have watched people stand still and, and, and watch the whole thing. Um, and this is the way in the center that we, we show the entire context of the bombing war. Um, I should say it's not a, it's not a museum, it's an exhibition center. There's only, there's only six items, uh, physical items in there and they all tell stories. Um, so if you think of a museum or an exhibition, they kind of use a timeline. The timeline in the center in this gallery is a 24 hour timeline that tells a bombing operation. Um, and the context of the war is largely told by um, this animation. And it's, it shows um, a, a lot of things. I think it's quite, it's, it's quite educational. It makes people think a little bit about what they know about the bombing war. Um, hopefully it makes people question what they know. You know, it shows the proportionality because a lot of people say, you know, well, they started it. And you know, this kind of shows it was, um, it, the war develops fairly evenly and, until, um, until towards the end of the war when, you know, the Allied bombing far outweighed the, the German bombing. It shows that um, the Allies dropped more tons of bombs on occupied Europe than the Luftwaffe did on, on the UK. Um, 
With, we also made the decision here to show the bombing campaigns that took place in Italy because we sort of were of the, of the opinion, although they're not strictly bomber command, they're flying the same aircraft to the same targets and the same risk. So we, we, we added in um, the Allied operations um, at first flying from North Africa and then Italy. Um, as the animation plays out, you can see the, the moving battlefronts, certainly up Italy, and you know, it goes really crazy around the, the, the 6th of June, 1944, of course. Um, the curating the exhibition was kind of done, everything was done the wrong way around, because in an ideal world, we'd have an archive to go and choose bits and pieces from to put in the exhibition. Um, but we didn't have a searchable archive at the time we were designing the exhibition. So it was uh, a lot harder work than it should be. And next time when I'm starting a digital archive and, a, and an exhibition, I'm going to do it the right way around, but no one. Um, we have had a chance later on to, to update some bits of the exhibition. Um, and we've uh, recorded a few more, more stories. So one of the things that we have throughout the exhibition are um, these sort of film performances. So we took stories from our or oral history interviews um, and we cast and costumed um, actors, uh, university drama students and, you know, different people who would fit the roles to tell the story as if, um, you know, the person who originally told us, it, the veteran, you know, it was as if it was them as the younger person telling the story. Um, and just after um the sort of recovery from from covid um we were fortunate enough to get some more funding to record some more and it was a joy to be able to go to the archive and find stories and uh, basically what we did was we just sort of changed the tense and a uh, little bit of editing um and we have uh, nine new stories in the in the exhibition and here's his five of them the photo was taken photos were taken um during costume or, or rehearsal, but these are shown on six foot tall screens. So it's as though the person standing in front of you. So um, there we have Ken Dunn, who tells a, a story about air sea rescue. Um, a chap playing Ralph Otty. Um, he was uh, a driver with 617 Squadron. He, he volunteered in uh, Jamaica and came over to the UK. Um, and drove at um, Woodall Spire, I think. Uh, then we've got somebody who, who's representing a, a, a chap who was in the guinea pig club. Um, Irene Howard, who was a, a warden, tells a story about the, the Manchester Blitz. Um, and a WAF who's playing uh, Mary Ward, who was a, what she, I think she was a map mark. Um, so that's some of the things that we have in the, the IBCC, the centre. <laughs> I didn't talk about the other galleries. So we have one that tells a story of the bombing war from a military perspective, both sides of the war. Um, another gallery tells a story from uh, about home fronts. And the third gallery is sort of the story of, of how Bomber Command and the bombing war has been remembered. Um, so building the digital archive, as I said, a lot of it was done the wrong way around. The first part of the process we were just really, really focused on gathering as much as we could while we still had the opportunity, very much aware that the people were passing away at a, a great rate. Um, it consists of two, two different sorts of, of archive material, uh, tangible items, which are um, letters, diaries, log books, um, these sorts of things, physical items you can hold in your hands. Um, and in the intangible, the oral history interviews that we've recorded. Um, the archive is housed at the University of Lincoln. It's now on uh, two servers. Again, they're separated by hundreds of yards. And we also have a, another copy of backup in the cloud. Um, we are publishing it all on a open source um, content management system called Omeka, which I will introduce you to in a little bit. It works, fingers crossed. Um, it's all being created, as I say, by four members of staff and umpteen volunteers. We've tried to follow the IBCC's ethos of remembrance, recognition and reconciliation. And as far as archiving goes, 
we're trying to do this um, by pushing inclusivity and including as many stories from as many wide different um, experiences as we possibly can. Um, the archive is looking at anybody that was involved in the bombing war in all theatres during the Second World War. Um, and we are, you know, when we're creating the metadata, which is the, the cataloging information um, for each individual item in the archive, um, we're capturing dates, places, um, tags, which I'll talk about a little bit more um, in a little while. Um, and if there is anything that is sort of text based, you know, any of the items, uh, we're having them transcribed. So this varies from a few scribbled words on the back of a photograph um, to diaries, to um, notes that people took during training, to you know, prisoner of war logbooks, these sorts of things. Um, we're also uh, transcribing every single oral history interview that we have. Um, and I'm also really proud of the way that we're dealing with logbooks. In, um, I don't think there's any other archives in the world that deal with logbooks in the way we do, or the way we record um, what's in there. Lots of other places, you know, you might get the logbook of, or the logbook of so-and-so who served in this squadron between these dates, and this is it. Um, but what we're recording is you know, the aircraft he flew, the stations he was, he was at, the squadrons he was on. Um, and then if he was operational, we, we record every single date that he flew that was an, an, an operation um, and every single place that you know, he went to was an operation. Um, a lot of this is, is being done uh, through crowdsourcing, through our volunteers. And since the archive became publicly available, it's also become a lot more of an iterative process and the crowdsourcing has sort of carried on. So nothing is ever sort of set in stone. If somebody gets in touch and says, oh, you know, I know a little bit more information about that one particular photo or I've recognized, you know, what that place is or what that thing is, it's dead easy for us to, to update the, the system, update the item. Um, what I would like to sort of do is Kind of explain the archive as a, as a bit of a metaphor. Um, it has it has grown largely through word of mouth, and people have you know got in touch. You know, I've got my uncle's, my great uncle's, my grandfather's collection. Are you interested? Yes. Um, so we have digitised, preserved, and published um, collections that have rarely been seen outside the family for 70, 80 years. So people bring in a shoe box or a tin box that's, you know, been on top of a wardrobe or at the back of a cupboard for, for decades that, that no one else has seen. Um, we digitize the items. Um, there's a form signed and they go straight back to the owners. This means there's a large element of chance to what we have in the archive. It's not particularly systematical. It's, you know, it's, it's not like the, the, it's not like the National Archives, um, you know, where they, they get traditional sources, you know, like the, um, the 540s, the operational record book. It's, it's a, you know, it's a much more haphazard uh, way of, of generating an archive. Um, but as, as I say, there's some beautiful stuff in there and it's not been seen by anyone else. I like to think of it um, sort of as a, as a metaphor. If places like the National Archives are a supermarket, we're more like a, a, a farmer's market, um, a bit more bespoke. Um, and as you know, both are useful if you're a historian or, or a chef or a cook, you go to the market to, to choose your ingredients to tell your story or bake your cake or whatever. Um, but as a farmer's market, sometimes you might go, you know, I want some of this and we haven't got any. So, yeah, it's 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 a little bit hit, hit and miss at times. Um, but I should also point out that we're always adding more stuff and we're always on the lookout for more items. Um, I think I said at the start, we, we opened the archive, it became public. We had about 2000 items in it. Um, we're currently at just around 30,000 public items um, and 2,200 collections and more in the pipeline. <clears throat> um, 
this is just a photo, uh, uh, you know, showing how we record oral history interviews. This is Flight Lieutenant Freddie Ball being interviewed by one of our volunteers, um, Annie Moody. He completed two tours with 49 and 44 Squadron. He was a wireless operator. Um, this photo was taken on taken really early in the project when he was interviewed in 2015, um, and he's since passed away. So again, this is why we we had you know there was so much urgency at the start of the project, and we were just you know recording as much as we could. Um, when I checked this morning, we've got 1,258 public interviews that you can you can listen to. Um, most of them are transcribed. It's well over 1,000. It's, it's you know, one, approaching 1,200 have been transcribed. I've just been sent in the whole uh, nine or ten new ones, new transcriptions to add. Um, bearing in mind, it takes an hour perhaps to record an interview. It takes ten hours to transcribe it. Um, so I think you know we, we, we're doing pretty well. Um, when we started in 2015, we thought if we recorded 30, about 300 interviews throughout the project we'll be doing really well so I think, you know we've, we've, uh, yeah I think we've exceeded uh, the expectations I've seen that Harry Bartlett is is uh, in the audience Harry is one of our volunteers as well as being the secretary for one of the association um, I think last time I looked Harry's recorded around 20 interviews um, I was listening to one of his a couple of days ago um, interviewed a chap called Gordon Mercier. He was 51 squadron at RAF Snaith, um, and he tells a fantastic story um, that they were shot up uh, coming and were coming back up from an operation um, and they had to land away from the base. I think they had to land, um, it's the Top Gear site, uh, Dunsfold, um, and then catch a train back home because the aircraft wasn't ever going to fly again. Um, trying to catch a train through London back up north, still dressed in the flying gear, carrying the parachutes, and the, the people on the platforms had a whip round and, and sent them on their way with uh, lots of cigarettes and things like that. So, yeah, some of the stories that are, are in there are absolutely fascinating. Um, I've, interv I've interviewed no end of people for, for this as well, and it is an absolute honour and a privilege to get to meet people. Um, the problem is, is you, you know, you, you meet someone, you get to know them, you have a good conversation, you build a, a bit of a relationship with them, and then later on you find out they've, they've passed away. Um, but there are some wonderful stories in there. One chap I interviewed, uh, a guy uh, called Reg Bulgar, um, who was profoundly deaf. He'd been a gunnery instructor, and uh, I think he'd been he'd been deaf for for decades. And I'd ask him a question which he didn't hear. Um, but he would answer the question that he wanted me to have asked him and talk for about 20 minutes and then I'd repeat it and ask another question and it and, and there's two hours of that it's absolutely wonderful stuff he tells a story of when he um, he was in a Hamden really on early on in the war and he uh, they had to ditch um, so they made a decent landing in the in the sea in the Ogin they all got out got in the dinghy um, and they thought they were somewhere off in the North Sea, probably off Wembra Head. Um, and they drifted for hours and then a, a, an aircraft flew overhead and they fired the flare. And a few hours later, um, a boat came out and they were saved. And uh, they asked the guy in, in the boat where they were. And he said, well, you're really lucky because another half an hour and you'd have drifted into a minefield and I wouldn't have come out to get you. And they said, well, where were we? Where are we? Thinking they were in the North Sea and they were a couple of miles off the Isle of Wight, apparently. So, yeah, again, illustrates uh, the, the state of navigation early on in the war. Um, we're still doing interviews. Um, what's happening at the moment is every now and then someone will get in touch with us because they've seen in a local paper that someone's just, you know, someone's had their 100th birthday. Um, and yeah, we, we didn't know they were still around. So we, we, if we can, we get in touch and, and, and record an interview. Um, I did one with a, a chap who was 102 uh, in Canada. I did it over, over Zoom. Um, 
chap called uh, another Reg. Um, he had the nickname Crash, Crash Harrison, because he, he actually survived four different crashes. Um, anyway, that's that's oral history interviews. Um, the tangible items we have, it's, it's letters, diaries, logbooks, photographs, um, odd bits of uniform. Um, and as I said, anything that has anything textual on it, like um, we've got uh, Gordon Cruikshank's diary there, bottom left, and the telegram top right. Anything that, that can be transcribed, um, we're, we're transcribing because people search the archive, they're probably wanting to find out about family members, so they're searching the name. And if there's a name anywhere in any bit of text, if it's transcribed, it's discoverable. If it's not transcribed, it won't be. Um, we've tried um, different software, but we've, we've found that the Mark One eyeball is, tends to be the best way of doing it. So we have lots of volunteers who, after a little bit of training, um, go to the go to items in the, in the archive that we've flagged up as as requiring transcription, and um, they, they they're transcribed. Um, I think I've seen Steve Baldwin in the uh, in the audience. He's he's our transcription coordinator, so everybody works through him. Um, looking at my notes, we've got thirteen thousand text items currently in the archive. Over eight thousand of those have been transcribed. Um, 6,000 of those items are letters, of which 5,000 of those have been transcribed. Um, and some of those, some, yeah, some of those are sort of mundane and normal and everyday, and it's, dear mum, it's freezing cold in Yorkshire, please can you send me some more socks? And sometimes it's, um, you know, if you're reading this, it means I've not come back from an operation. Um, there's some fantastic letters written by a chap called Peter Lamprey, um, he was uh, he was the eighth man on the the special squadron 101 squadron that flew from Ludford Magna that was um, involved in trying to disrupt the, the Luftwaffe fighter control. So they, they had German speakers on board who would um, send out they'd find the um, they'd find the right frequency and then disrupt the frequency by sending out fake orders to the night fighters. Um, What's unusual about him was he was writing to um, an ex-work colleague. He was he was a little bit older than the rest of the crew. He'd worked as a in the printers in London before he, he volunteered. Um, and whereas lots of the other letters people are writing home to their mothers or their wives or their girlfriends, and they're a bit reluctant to actually say what operations were like. Um, you know, don't worry about me, darling. Everything's fine. Kind of kind of letters. Um, he was writing to a workmate. Um, and really didn't pull any punches when he was, you know, when he'd been on a really horrible operation, he told about it. Um, and the other wonderful thing about his, his letters um, is they're written in absolutely lovely, beautiful handwriting in, in, and a lot of capital letters, so it's really easy to read. Um, <clears throat> um, we've also got on that, that, that slide there, there's a couple of photographs. Um, so the, the diary is, is Gordon Cruikshank's diary. Um, his diary also tells a story, actually. Um, it starts off when he's in Canada training um, and he writes pages and pages and it's all about how excited he is flying and what Canada's like and, you know, the, the, the girls he's meeting in Canada. And you follow him throughout training um, back across the Atlantic. Uh, heavy conversion unit, operational training unit, onto operations. And the further he gets down his uh, his tour, the less and less he's writing in his, in his diary. It's almost like you can read the stress uh, that, that's that's coming through the pages to you. Um, until he's, all he's recording is is a number of his operation where the target was and the bomb load. But it's just this this change in, in the way he was writing is absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, telegrams is the far too many telegrams that say that people have been missing or um, have, have found to be killed. There's a few of them where it's, you know, we've, we've found he's a prisoner of war and he's okay, but they're, they're, always, they're always quite harrowing to read. Um, photographs, we have target photographs um, where we can, um, we try and locate those to, you know, show exactly where they were in, uh, in Europe when, when the photo was taken. 
Um, that's another another role that a lot of volunteers are, are working on. Um, and the the chap in the photo is uh, is is Harry Brooks. He was killed over Bracebridge, which is close to the the, the site of the IBCC. Um, his Lancaster collided with another one. Two two Lancs took off from RF Waddington. Um, had a mid-air collision and, and him and other people were, were, were killed. So yeah, some, sometimes it's, it's, it's hard work going through the, these things in, in the archive. Um, so it's, it was, was just talking to, to Claire and Harry before this, this started. We have a lot of collections that have been given to us by the families of people like Harry Brooks in this photograph because you know, everything was preserved because they passed away during the war. Um, we have a lot of collections that go along with people who we've interviewed who survived the war and we've interviewed them and, you know, as well as recording their interview, we've, we've taken copies of their log books and their photos and things. Um, we do have a bit of a gap of people who, you know, perhaps have survived the war but passed away before we could, you know, get in touch and interview them. Um, but we're very much aware there are lots of collections out there of people who may have stuff that belong to a family member. Um, and it'd be, be absolutely wizard if they you know, get in touch because what we do is we digitize things, we make copies and we give them straight back. But then you know, the copies are then, um, we're, we're then sharing them with, with everybody else. Um, and it's all free folks. Um, so this is where I'm going to show you a little bit about how the archive works. I think I have to stop sharing my screen and then start sharing it. Again. Where's my mouse? Share screen, and I want this one. Is that still working? Yep, that's fine, Dan. Right, brilliant. Okay, so this is the bit that nobody gets to see, or very few people get to see. Um, this is the, the back end, the, the sort of where we put things together in the archive. It's, the system is called Omeka. Um, and if I click add an item, I will show you a little bit about how it works. Um, we have lots of different fields that we fill in. Some of them are obvious, some of them are a bit more tricky. Um, so the first thing would be the, the title of, of whatever the item is. So, you know, the logbook of. Um, and then we have a description. So in the case of a, of a logbook, it would describe you know, who, whose logbook it was and what operations they flew in and what aircraft they flew in. So that's, that's a, a, you know, a large bit of descriptive text. Um, if it's a letter, we would say, you know, this is a letter from so-and-so to, and in, in the letter, they discuss whatever they talk about. Um, the creator is whoever's, um, actually created the item so if, whoop, hello. if it was a letter it would be you know who who wrote the letter um quite some of these some of these we don't know so they, they get left blank you know who took the photograph we don't know we don't we don't fill it in um we have two things for dates um the first one is the date the item was created so in the case of the oral history interview it would be when the interview was recorded so 2017 or whatever. Um, but then temporal coverage, this is a little bit different um, in that if we interviewed somebody in 2017 and they were talking about what happened on D-Day, the date we would put in there would be 19, you know, the 6th of June, 1944. Um, all of these fields can be duplicated. So if, he talks, you know, if somebody talks about more than one date, we can just add in more. And when it comes to log books and they're flying, you know, 30 operations in a tour, we can, uh, we can add an awful lot of fields into this, this section. Spatial coverage is where things occurred. And again, if we're interviewing a person, um, they might talk about, you know, training in Canada, um, the crossing over the Atlantic, where they were stationed as a heavy conversion unit, where they were on operations, the raids that they went on so you know we might add in various places from Canada to Germany or, or wherever um all of these fields you'll notice these are just you, you just put in text I better not add, press that add thing but 
this is, you know, these are text fields, the volunteers who create these items, all their errors, spelling mistakes <laughs> that, that go in there, they stay in there. Um, we do have style guides to try and get the, the different users uh, to, to be consistent, but we, you know, we're very much aware that, that, that mistakes do, do go in every now and then. And um, for anyone that does any kind of archiving this way or computer programming, there's, there's something called GIGO, G-I-G-O, which stands for garbage in, garbage out. Um, and you know, this works for when people are typing in, in the boxes, but it also works for when people are trying to search. If you misspell a search term, you probably won't find the answer that you're looking for. Um, other fields to try and do away with that sort of thing, we do have drop downs. So, you know, if we have a photograph and we know it's to do with bomber command as opposed to fighter command, you would click that. Um, we're an international project. Um, so we do have things that come in in different languages. So if it was a German document that we were looking at, you would click that. Um, the other important thing uh, is a sort of quick description of what the item is. Now, this means that we're able to group items all together. So if, if we have a memoir here, you click that, that would then enable people just to search the archive for memoirs. Um, and you can see some of the other different things that we have in there. So um, you know, hopefully you'll, you'll see they're all slightly different. But these are sort of a, a, an idea of some of the things that you, you can see if you search the archive. Um, formats and other sort of description. Um, and these are the things that uh, um, a, a publisher and rights, these are sort of the, the legal things that just fit onto, we, we put onto every single item. The identifier, every object has a totally unique identifier. So that gets copied and pasted into that box. So that's that bit. Um, <clears throat> when we record dates, we do it in rather a strange way. So that would be D-Day. Um, as you see, it's not the British way of doing things. It's not the American way of doing things, um, but it enables the system to search either for a particular day or a particular year. So when you're actually, when, when you're doing the searches, which I'll show you later on, if you want to just search for 1944, you put 1944 in it, bring up everything that also has that string afterwards. Um, and with places, again, to use consistency, we're using um, the places that are recorded using uh, the, the Library of Congress um, formatting. So um, it's, it's, it's a little bit to get your head round, but if we're wanting to record something that was in Lincolnshire, that didn't work, did it? Oh, I'll put it in the wrong box, you see. What was I saying about garbage in, garbage out? So it tends to be um, the country and then the place. I'm about just to leave it. I'm not going to save it anyway. Um, I should probably say again, it's an iterative process. So you know, it's, it's quite often that you know the page will be visited by different people numerous times to, to tweak things. Um, this is another one of the tasks that is, is done by volunteers. Um, the transcriptions get added um, later on, usually by going to this page and then um, oh, they're adding, copying and pasting the text into that box. Uh, if it's a document or you know, clicking that one, if it's a, an oral history. Um, the files are added pretty much it's the same as adding something to social media. You, you can click and paste or, or, or you know, select things from, from a file there. Um, and then the other thing that we have that the volunteers, the metadata creators do is add tags to things. So um, if, we, if we're looking at a photograph and we know it's of an air crew from 102 Squadron um, and we put in here 102 Squadron and then add tags, um, this enables users of the archive to just bring up everything that there is um, about 102 Squadron. Um, I'm just, just checking my notes. So I said just about everything. Yes. 
I think so. Um, items are always added together as collections. Um, um, and they're added in pretty much the same way. Um, we have a little description of what would be in that particular item. Um, I'm going to go back there and then, so that's how the archive gets created. I'm now going to have a little go at telling you all how to search it and get the best results. Um, so if we just click on that one and then there. And we go to the home page. This is now uh, what users will see. Um, so this is the home page. Um, you can find the home page by sticking IBCC Digital Archive into Google or by going to the IBCC pages, clicking on the history tab and uh, following the links. And there's a couple of couple of clicks till you get to this page. Um, what I should say is it doesn't work like Google. Um, so if somebody is looking for uh, Flight Lieutenant Smith and you put Flight Lieutenant Smith in the search box and click search, you get 5,737 hits, which is not helpful. Um, and they will vary. You know, we've got a Flight Lieutenant Smith, um, Flight Lieutenant Johnston, Flight Lieutenant, and we've got a Smith Albert. So how the system works is, it actually looks for every instance of flight, every instance of lieutenant, and every instance of Smith. Um, so if you're searching for a particular person, it's probably best to search for the most unusual part of the name. There was Smith, obviously, that's a bit tricky. Um, but there are a few other ways of, of, of doing it. So if you click these three little dots here and then hit that button where it says it, exact match, it will now search for instances of flight lieutenant smith and then hit go did i hit go yes it just thinks about it um and then it brings up two items which probably although it's you know it probably isn't the right flight lieutenant smith but it probably feels a little a little better than trying to look through five thousand items if you are looking for a particular person that's kind of the way to do it you probably want to tweak what you add in there and you know combinations of names and initials and those sorts of things again it's, it's as i said it's best to go for the most unusual part of their their name um let's go back to the start page the other way of doing it would be to see if we have a collection about them as i said everybody um that brings in a collection they are kept together in a sort of digital uh, surrogate collection now this actually is a, is a coincidence, um, but yeah, you know, the the one hundred and two squadron collection is, is the first one, and then it goes through all the other numbers, um, and then we we start on with with the people's names. Um, but as I said at the start, we've got two thousand two hundred collect two thousand two hundred seventy three collections um, in the archive. So again, that would take an awful lot of scrolling. So the other way of doing it would be to put Smith into the box, click the little buttons there. We don't have to worry about exact match, but if you uncheck that, it will now just search for collections. And we have 39 collections of, you know, that are about people called Smith. Um, so there, that would cut down your scrolling and searching time. Um, if you're searching for, if you're not searching for people and you're searching for uh, particular squadrons or a particular station, that gets really easy as well. Um, if you go here, click on browse tags, um, there are hundreds of tags in the archive. Um, the first two things you come across here are, you know, the, the squadrons or the stations. So if you open that up, and if we were looking for 102 squadron, you scroll down a little bit. This then brings you to a sort of start page for 102 squadron. Um, if you click that, it will take you to every single item in the archive that is to do with um, 102 squadron. 
that button will take you to the losses database. Um, all of these are hyperlinks. There's, there's a little bit of a description about 102 Squadron. But here's where the, all the work that the volunteers who create the metadata starts to pay off. Because if you, if you look here, these were some of the um, choices from that drop down menu. Um, and you can search by file type. So if we, so we're, you know, we're, we're looking at things that are to do with uh, 102 Squadron. If you click photographs, that is going to bring in the, the photographs of, that we have um, that are to do with 102 Squadron. We scroll down, you know, there are two pages of those. Uh, that's quite an interesting photo, the damage to a, to a Whitley really early on in the war that got home amazingly um portrait of john blair um yeah the, yeah these are sort of some of the things that that we have um john blair's really interesting story there were 500 i think air crew uh, who flew with the rf from uh, from jamaica and the west indies um if you want to search just for interviews, there are a couple of ways of, 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 of doing that. But if you want interviews that are just about um, people who are involved with 102 Squadron, you click sound and it brings up 31. Um, I think I think Ernest Jeffrey is one of, one of Harry's interviews. Um, I think he tells a story where he used to stick his, his he was ground crew and he used to stick his chewing gum to the, um, uh, to the undercarriage of an aircraft before it took off as a bit of a good, uh, as a bit of a sort of good luck charm. Um, as I said most of these interviews have been transcribed, um, and that means you can you know you can then search the transcriptions for for any particular word that you that you're looking for or a key term. Um, go back to the start again so that, it works exactly the same for RAF stations um, it does involve a bit of bit of strolling but um, you know when you get to this the station that you're looking for so 102 squadron because of because of Claire and Harry this does exactly the same sort of thing so you can search for photographs of RAF Pocklington um, lots and lots of Halifaxes uh, some target photos, fairly horrendous crash that, that resulted in a fire. Um, what else do we have? You can search for logbooks by clicking this one. Um, which one should we look at? So if you click on there, that will take you to the copy of the logbook. It is uh, an example of some of the information that's that's in there, and every single term in there is searchable. Um, if we scroll down, um, this is where we've put all the dates in. So he was, you know, he was in the RF and flying in 41 and 42, but all of these dates are when he was operational. And you can see we've had to um, add more and more fields as we go along. And these are the places that uh, are mentioned in the logbook. Um, and then at the, at the bottom will be all the tags. So these are, you know, he was in the heavy conversion unit, he flew Harvards, he flew all these different marks of Halifaxes. Um, and these are all links. So if you click on any one of these, it brings together all the items that are, that are also to do with those things. You can um, search the archive in a couple of other ways as well. Let's go back. Um, one more. So these are all, lots of other tags that you can search search through. But we can also um, look at places because we've recorded, you know, every single item that has uh, has a place. There's a plot on a the map. There are three thousand different plots. Um, this kind of shows just how international. Um, Bomber Command was. We've carried on telling the stories. You know, if, if we've got somebody who, who served in Bomber Command and then was posted um, somewhere else, 
we've carried on telling their stories and recording their information. Um, and of course, places in Canada, um, you know, these would be where they, they were training. Um, so I'll just click on that one, that's fairly easy to see. That brings in, brings together six items that are all about this tiny little rock in the middle of the ocean. And we've got two photographs and a couple of interviews. You could mention that place. Um, I talked a bit about how you can search the, the transcriptions. There's the transcription of the interview. You can listen along and, and read along to what's going on. But the dodge to find out what you're looking for is to do control F. Um, and then at some point he talks about the rock in the middle of the sea. You click that again, and that's you know he's he's talking about a, a training flight. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're, we're never really sure what people are going to use the archive for, what they're going to want to search for. But because everything that we can transcribe is transcribed, if there's a word or a phrase in there. Um, that somebody's interested in in the future and they they search for it, it pops up and you know this uh, the archive has been useful. Um, the other way you can search, um, we've done the same thing for um, aerial photographs, so they have been plotted and geolocated, um, and you can search a map and, and look at aerial photographs. Uh, it's another another role that volunteers have been doing. Um, and we can also search the archive by by dates. Um, again, it's another one that you have to have to scroll quite a lot because you know everything is all there on the one page. Um, where are we? It's the uh, 29th today, isn't it? So 29th of March, 1942. We've got nine items: logbooks, uh, bibliography, yeah, another logbook, photograph, Miss Miami beauty pageant. There you go. That'll have been during training. <clears throat> um, so there are a couple of other ways of searching the, the archive. Um, you can use the advanced search to combine any of these searches. Uh, you can get to the advanced search either by scrolling down to the bottom and clicking on there, or again, you come up to these three dots and click that, that takes you to an advanced search. Um, and this is where you combine things. It's a, it's a little bit tricky, but once you get the hang of it, it brings up some fantastic results. So, you know, temporal coverage contains, um, and the date in a funny order, and you add a field, and you go spatial coverage contains, cheer in perhaps, And it brings together things that have got you know both those dates and places in there. So we have um, a logbook of somebody who flew on an operation to bomb Turin on that date in 1942, and an interview with somebody who was in Turin on that date in 1942. So this is a, a way that the archive is is trying to work inclusive inclusively and to work for reconciliation by bringing these totally separate stories together. Um, I'll show you. I'll show you a few other searches that you can do. Um, <clears throat> so if we go type contains, I think that probably says photograph, I can't see. Um, and if we put Yorkshire in there, if I spelt it right, and then add a tag, You'd expect this is going to bring photographs of Halifaxes that were taken in Yorkshire in that day. Yeah, 100. So, you know, the more you get to know the archive and how, how it works and the, the, the way we put things together, the more you can combine things and um, whittle things down or, or find new and interesting combinations of, of what's available in there. Um, the other way that I should probably just show you, um, just try this is um, 
if you want to combine tags, you separate them with um, semicolon. So I've not actually tried this, so this is either going to work or it's not. But if it doesn't work, we'll just change what we're searching for. Okay, so 14 photographs that have been tagged Halifax and knows, knows are and uh, were taken in Yorkshire. So um, I said I'd show a couple of amazing things that sort of just um, um, have been drawn to my attention recently. Um, and then I shall hand back to Claire because I've been talking for ages, haven't I? Um, let's see, Gar Guy Girl, can't, can't spell. No, I've already written it in there, Gaslight. There we go. Um, I went to see a production of Gaslight, the play about gaslighting from where the term came from. Um, and it came up in the archive recently. So this is a this is a prisoner of war's uh, diary. Um, the Red Cross uh, gave diaries to POWs, um, wartime logs, and they put in them whatever they wanted. Some use them as scrapbooks. Um, lots of them sort of wrote fantasy menus and, and recipes in there. Um, so others filled them with drawings and cartoons and, and those sorts of things. This um, this chap, there's a couple of really interesting pencil crane drawings, and then um, photographs that were taken at, at Stalag Luff Three um, in the theatre, um, and it includes these two photographs of the uh, of the cast of, of the play Gaslight. Um, I think some of the some of the stuff we've got to do with prisoners of war is absolutely fascinating. But you know, here we've got. The cast of what is it seven um and a couple of you know three of the roles uh female characters um and they got the costumes and the staging and it's yeah i think it's absolutely fantastic with some of the some of the shows that they put on and some of the things they did when they weren't you know when they weren't escaping or uh, being incredibly bored um the other thing that i thought would be uh that that really struck me recently um is this photo it's of a, of a of quite a young looking chap. Um, what's unusual him, he's got an air crew brevet, he was an air gunner, um, but he was also a leading air craftsman. So uh, this is right at the start of the war before you had to be uh, at least a sergeant to, to fly on operations. Um, and we have this photograph of, of, of him, oh, I've gone back too far. Um, and if you go in his collection, uh, he was killed on the 12th of April, 1940. Um, I think he was he was 19. So that's, uh, I think, Claire, that's uh, pretty much the end of my uh, presentation. Hopefully I've done everything I said I was going to do. That's amazing. Stop sharing. <laughs> um, I was just looking at the notes and the chat. So Mike saying POW logs are amazing things to read. I would, yeah, I totally agree with that. There are a lot of even publications, you know, documents out there that give you a, an amazing um, insight to what camp life is like. Yeah. A wartime log. Yeah. <clears throat> um, again, yeah, they're, they're fantastic. Um, the, the first one I ever saw was back in 2015. And, you know, I was blown away. It is a very good one. It's, it belonged to Les Rutherford and it's you know, definitely one of, the, one of the better ones. But it was the first one I had seen. And I thought it was fairly unique. If you saw, search the archive for wartime log, yeah. we've got quite a lot of them now. Um, yeah. And you know, they all they all vary, um, but they're all you know, they're all fascinating in their own in their own right. If there's text in there, it's been transcribed. Um, the photographs have been described. The cartoons and, and drawings have been described. So again, you can search them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, mean, I love those. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, obviously, I had got permission by you know yourselves to use um, an interview for a guy um, who went who went through a similar situation to the guy. I was doing a World War Two airman, you know, how to research World War Two airman, and although I couldn't find anything in the IBCC archive, I managed to get this audio of this guy that went through the same experience. So sometimes you might not find something about your relative in 
the archive, but you will find things of people who went through similar situations, which gives you an insight into what life was like for for so many people, depending, you know, whether it was evaders or, or prisoners of war or whatever it happens to be. Yeah, I mean, we have tags for prisoners of war. Um, the way we've, the way I showed you how you can search the archive based on squadrons and stations is, is very popular with users. For that reason, you know, if they can't find their relative, they can get a, a, a gist of what it was like um, on, you know, on the station at the same time. We have tags that include things like um, uh, military service conditions or military living conditions. You know? So if anybody's talking, you know, what it was like inside a Nissen hut, you know, the winter of 44, 45, that's, that's there as well. Um, I think Nissen huts are tag as well. So you could combine, you know, yeah. military living conditions and Nissen hut to just, you know, you just get those. Yeah, because um, yeah, it was bleak. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't remember where it was, but I, I read of a WAF who had gone to sleep and she'd let her hair down before she went to sleep and it had touched the sides of the Nissen hut and the condensation had run oh. down the, the, the hut and then frozen. Oh. And she had to get her nail scissors to cut her hair so she could actually get out of bed. <laughs> Gosh. Um, so I know Hazel has said um, she tried the website out yesterday and found it a bit clunky, but these tips will certainly help. Hazel, you haven't mentioned what you were struggling with. If you want to either put it into the chat or unmute yourself, you could certainly ask Dan if you want. She's still here. Maybe not. No, I wasn't looking for anything in particular. Well, I was looking for India, but um, it was more how did it work? And I did find it clunky, but your tips will help me find a lot more. My dad was an armorer in India between 43, I think, and 46. Uh -huh. And I do have his log and have pictures. And I've got an album of things in India and men in India. And, uh, but I'm sometimes, I'm not really sure what half the stuff is that I've got. Uh -huh. I mean, and I've, okay. also, I've also got something, and I said it to Claire somewhere. I've got three copies of a magazine called Serviette. And it seems to have been constructed on an RAF station in India. Okay. Just at the end of the war, and one episode, I think, after one edition, just after the war had finished. Uh-huh. Um, so one would be very interested to include that in the archive if you want to get in touch. Um, the, yeah, the, the were, there's quite a lot of stations and units that created their own sort of unofficial newsletters or newspapers. Um, it's similar to the way that um, there were trench publications in the First World War, but um, the archives got quite a number of um, magazines that were put together by training units. Um, South Africa and Canada immediately spring to mind. Um, I don't think we've got anything from India. We do have a lot of photo albums. I mean, when, when people were posted overseas, Certainly in, in the fall in in the forties when people didn't didn't normally travel, you know, it's an ideal opportunity to get a camera and, and take take photos to, to record the journeys. Um, and we have got quite a quite a number of um, albums of people's experiences um, in places like India. So yeah, if you if you try searching using the map or searching using um, the spatial coverage, you should find things that are, that are in in the archive that are about India. Um, so if we do want to send you something, do we just send it to IBC Bomb Digital Collection at the University of Lincoln? Um, well, you can't, kind of, yeah. I mean, don't don't just go put in put in the original things in the post. But if you want to get in touch, um, we can have a conversation about the ways of ways of doing it. Um, it tends to be yeah, get things down to us at the, the university offices or to the centre 
Um, and if your collection's not too big and we're expecting you, you know, we can we can scan while you go and have a look around with a cup of coffee. Um, some of the items in the archive have been um, digitized, you know, in, in situ and then sent to us as, as digital copies. But we, we prefer to to take our own scans because we have some pretty shiny, expensive equipment that does it really well and really fast. Um, but please do get in touch and we can have a talk about it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, Margaret has actually asked a kind of similar question that covers India as well. She said that her father's late service, her late father's service record um, says that he was in, it says 322 MU. And Maintenance then, unit. Maintenance unit, yep. And September 44, she said the next line said India command. So you might want to carry out the same type of search, Margaret. Um, and just look and see what there is for India. Um, David says, many thanks, Dan, for the inspiring talk and Claire for organising. It has a pilot log for you. Is there any information on those injured and hospitalised? Um, top of my head, not in our archive at the moment, no. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in um, the medical officers. Um, and some of the, you know, uh, some of the hospitals, but it's not something really that I've I've come across in our archive. So, uh, unfortunately, not at the moment. I think. Um, it said this is all part of the the sort of scattergun word of mouth process in which the archive's been put together. Um, but what I should also say is we are adding items all the time. So just because nothing turns up when you first search, you know, give it a month or two and, and try again. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, Harry has said that there is an interview in the archive about ground crew in India. He's currently, I think, rifling through his desk right. to find the name of the person. So, you know, give him a minute and let's uh, see what he comes back with. I know um, we have some we, we have some stuff. Um, uh, I think it was 1946. There was uh, almost a mutiny in, in India. Um, the, the people who were over there, had, you know, had had enough. They'd been overseas for far too long. And, you know, when's our turn for time for demob and coming home um, and there are some photos and a few documents about that in the archive which is absolutely fascinating yeah dan hello harry uh sorry to interrupt um i just i'm struggling at the moment with papers are all tipped up um that interview in india is the one where the chap had the camera license and he took the photographs of the actual mutiny it was a, it was actually recorded as a mutiny yeah, yeah. and he had the <clears throat> photograph of the air officer commanding India addressing the the scruffy um all the scruffy airmen who who refused to wear full uniform etc yeah and, and I should really remember his name but I can't yeah, I, I, I he, can see it in, he lived he lives in, in he lives in Leicestershire he's yeah. uh, his granddaughter is a policewoman um I'm just struggling to find his name at the moment but it is in there well search so, the archive for mutiny it'll pop up <laughs> um, so Mike is asking how far are you behind in the process of getting items into the archive <laughs> he said i.e if someone gets uh, if something gets sent in tomorrow how long does it take before it's up and searchable uh, it's uh, it's how long is a piece of string it's, um, we're trying to do first in first out but every now and then there'll be something that um, you know I, I think we should probably push through um i'm doing my best yeah i know steve thanks <laughs> um it's also really hard to tell because when we um when we digitize a collection if there's a log book uh, that's say 50 60 pages we scan it as 50 60 pages and it becomes 50 or 60 digital files when we then put them back together to create one item for the archive as a, as a log book it becomes one item. So although we know how many files we have that have yet to be processed, we don't know how that will work into uh, individual items. Um, and every item is different and every item takes a different length of time um, to work on. And all the work is being done by volunteers who you know, um, might work really, really quickly or really, really slowly. So. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 one of those things that is, I really can't put um, 
put a put a number on. Um, uh, uh, you know, depending what's in a logbook, a logbook might take half an hour. It might take four hours. You know, to to work through. Um, and as you, you've hopefully you've you've seen when you're adding the the fields of the metadata, if um, if somebody's talking an awful lot and, and you know, lots of dates and lots of places, every single one of those takes you know, a few minutes to to um, to put into the system. Um, but yeah, we're 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 going as, as 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 fast as we can. And the important thing to remember is is everything that we have digitized, even though it might not be public yet, it has been digitized and it has been preserved. It is safe, and we will get there in the in the in the end. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I, I mean, obviously, I deal with the one hundred two squadron archive, so I can totally sympathise with that because I obviously feel that you know you do have maybe a bit more time over the winter months to do mm. something like that rather than um, you know over the summer months. So, um, so Harry said the India interview is John Shipman at three one seven maintenance unit. So if anyone's interested in looking that up, you can you can do a search for that. Thanks, Harry. Did you search the archive for that or did you remember it? No, I found the piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dan. That's that's a bit how we were trying to do things when we were trying to build the exhibition when we didn't have an archive. It was, oh, we've got an interview with someone that would be really useful or I've seen a photograph in a collection, but I've no idea, you know. And we would have people going through thousands of files on a hard drive just to find this one photograph of, of you know a bomber crew in front of a Halifax or whatever you know yeah I mean I could have put in RAF mutiny but that might have been uh, <laughs> that might have been censored <laughs> <laughs> who knows so I think um, the other thing Dan is that you're obviously always looking for volunteers and um, you know people to contribute as well uh, yeah that, sorry I've just distracted because I've just put it in it's there's the first, if you put in mutiny, the first hit is is a really nice photo album. So, <laughs> yeah, it's all there. Now I've lost Zoom. Where have you all gone? There you go. Sorry, what was what was a, what were you saying, Claire? Uh, no, I'm just saying. I take it you're always on the lookout for volunteers. Yes, always on the lookout for volunteers. Um, de depending on where you are in the world, there you know, are different tasks that volunteers can do. Um, training is provided. Um, yeah, we have we have volunteers who are working with Steve Baldwin's team doing transcriptions from you know Singapore and Australia and all over the place. You don't have to actually be able to get into the offices at Lincoln. Um, probably is a book about flack over my shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone just asked a question about the book. Yeah, about flack. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we're we're always on the lookout for more volunteers. We're always on the lookout for people who have collections of material. Um, um, one of the things that I didn't say, I, 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 I mentioned that it's an iterative process. If you if you look on the archive pages at the at the bottom of the the home screen, um, there's a there's a box that's entitled mystery items, and if you click that, there are items in the archive that you know there is a some as a photograph of a place that we're sure if somebody knows that particular place, we you know where it is, they will say, oh yeah, you know that's so and so um, and there are people who we don't know who they are and you know if a family member sees that we go, oh that's my great granddad and we've got a name to a face then so there, there's there's mystery items and every now and then someone will get in touch with me and say you know after after spending a couple of hours on google earth i've located where this photograph was taken that's there a great idea <laughs> yeah there was there was one chap that got in touch with me he was looking at a collection and he worked out that was there was a wedding photo in there and he worked out that from you know other items in the collection that it was probably the wedding was probably in Bristol. Um, and then he went and virtually walked up lots and lots of streets in Bristol until he found the right street. And he got in touch saying it's so and so street in Bristol. Um, but I'm very sorry, it could be any one of six houses. <laughs> <laughs> he pinned it down to the six houses on a street in Bristol after. Yeah. Um, uh, but it, there, there are you know, photos and, and items and and people in there that oh the other thing is um every now and then there'll be a, a bit of handwriting that just we just can't get our head around quite often it's signatures but if somebody recognizes their family members scroll on the bottom of a letter then we can we can update the system and 
um, you know, it becomes a mystery no more. So that's another way you can you can help just by having a look at the mystery item. Yeah. Fab, um, I suppose my question is, are you always learning? You oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and every day, every every day, every now and then is Christmas because there'll be, you know, some wonderful items, some wonderful collection. Um, yeah. I'd say the, the couple of items I've just shown you, um, the, the the POW theatre photos, and, and, you know, I, I love seeing that. I, you know, I now know that, you know, they put on a production of, of Gaslight and, you know, other, other plays and, it's, it's fascinating. It must be hard, um, as they say in family history terms, you know, not to get down that rabbit hole, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd I say, mean, you that's, know, the, 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 you know, how, how long does it take to um, to publish an item? We try to just add the description using what we've got in front of us. So if there's a photograph and it's got an aircraft and you can read the squadron codes, it's okay looking up what the squadron code was so you can then tag the squadron. Um, but going down the rabbit hole of, of research to you know pin down that one tiny little fact, it can be counterproductive. You know, you, do you spend four hours doing one bit of research for one line of the description or do you move on and leave it as a mystery? Mm -hmm. Yeah, every now and then you get you get caught up with it. I spent I spent a good hour and a half of the other day trying to trying to find out what a particular medal was because I hadn't seen it before. Right. And in my excuse, it was out of my comfort zone. It was from the Korean War. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing was um, somebody else actually asked Brian. I think came in later. Actually, he said, um, "Remind me, Danny. He's actually mentioned what date do the the bomber commands um, records go up to? I think you you said post war. What date did you say?" Um, so the, the, the losses database um, includes all those who lost their lives flying with Bomber Command during yeah, when it was Bomber Command. So when it's changed to Strike Command, that's when the losses database is, stops. Right. And yeah, I'm sorry, I can't remember when it was in the 60s that that was. It was yeah, late 60s. Uh -huh. um, so the losses are from 36 to 60. Yeah. 68. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, terrible historian. Can't do dates. Um, <laughs> Too much yeah, information. <laughs> yeah, the, the digital archive. So um, we're interested in the life story of anybody who, who was involved in the bombing war. So if people bring in a collection that includes, you know, their life or their, you know, perhaps their parents' lives before the war, um, and then what they did during the war and you know the service and then what they where they were posted afterwards and they continued to serve and you know they were posted to India or Japan or wherever we will include um, the items in the collection so it's a, it's a little bit fuzzy um, the the archive housed by the University of Lincoln is gen is tending to focus on 39 to 45 for the war but as I say if there are items in a collection that continue past 1945 will include them. Um, there's another separate project that's being run at the IBCC, at the centre, um, separate from the, the university's digital archive, which is doing a very similar thing with post-war stories and Cold War stories. Um, but that's going to be a separate archive. Okay. Yeah, held differently. Um, um, but that, um, that, I think, is going to go up to, to 68. Mm -hmm. Possibly. I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your presentation. It's been really informative. I think um, that will make uh, searching the, the archive a bit easier moving forward for all of us. Um, yeah, hopefully we can share the link and when people go, I can't find anything, we'll just send them to, to this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. Are you going to be hanging about for the next 10 minutes? or? Can do, yeah. Yeah, I've got something that I purchased recently that I'm going to show you. I'm going to look for it during this little recording. Um, to see whether you've seen something like this before. Um, so let's just quickly move on. Um, I've now got a pre-recorded interview with John Starkey where he talks about his book, The RES Cross Channel Offensive. Um, so let me just uh, share that for you. Oh. Wait a minute till I get the right one. 
You'll notice that I've got a uh, wallpaper of Guy Gibson there. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, I thought I've seen him before somewhere. <laughs> he looks so familiar, yep. <laughs> Share sound. Hi, I would like to welcome John Starkey, who's here today to talk to us about his recently released book, The RAF's Cross-Channel Offensive. Hi, John, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Claire. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak to me today. So I'd love to know a bit about your book and what the inspiration was behind publishing this book. Um always been interested in uh, aircraft, military, history, etc. Uh, a lot about the First World War and the Second World War. And uh, I just thought it was a, a subject, those two years of 1941 and 42, which had not been covered in any detail in regard particularly to the command of the RAF at the time. Mm -hmm. We all know a lot about the planes and the pilots who flew them, etc., and what jolly good chaps they were and everything <laughs> like that. But we didn't know a lot about the actual top brass and what they were doing. Yeah. Yeah, because that's it. There's so, so much focus on the Battle of Britain and it sort of phases out after that, I suppose. You know, there's not as much um, spoken about what happens. But then, as you say, it's all concentrated a lot on the few and and who the pilots were and, and a lot less about you know the top brass so to speak so 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 you so you delved into that then how did you go about your research um i, I read over 50 books um a lot of them i'd, I'd already got uh but then i also also i use the web quite a bit there's no doubt about it and of course There isn't a lot that is accusatory about what what went wrong and so forth out there. There's a lot about the, as I said before, the aircraft and the pilots and the engines and so forth. But there isn't really very much about the thinking that went on in the top brass as to why they did things and undertook certain strategies and campaigns. Mm -hmm. That's true, that's true. Um... And what do you think was the most surprising thing that you discovered while you were researching it then? In 19, at the end of 1940, um, Dowding, Hugh Dowding, who had been in command of Fighter Command, was uh, quite summarily dismissed. And so was his captain of 11 Group, Keith Park, who had been at the forefront of the Battle of Britain. And they were... Uh, removed by some very ambitious officers, uh, William Sholto Douglas, a relative of the Marquis of Queensbury, and Trafford Leigh Mallory, who took over those respective positions. In November 1940, Trenchard, who had commanded the Royal Flying Corps in the First World War and had kept up his contacts, went to visit Sholto Douglas at the Air Ministry and Sholto Douglas asked Trenchard for his advice as to what he should do next after the Battle of Britain was over. And Trenchard said uh, that he needed to, quote, lean towards France, which was really a carry on of the offensive attitude that Trenchard had used in the First World War. And if you hark back to that, you will see that the British airmen suffered more casualties than the Germans because Trenchard had them forever flying on the other side of the lines. Yeah. So if someone got shot down, if you were British, you were a prisoner. If you were German you were, and you survived this, you were free to fly again. Well, it may have worked in some ways because the British were on the winning side in the First World War, but in 1941, the British then, using this idea, sent their, basically did a Battle of Britain in reverse over France. 
and they ran into all the same problems that the Germans had in the Battle of Britain, i.e. they sent squadrons of Spitfires to escort six Blenheims each time, and they tied the fighters far too closely to the bombers. The German fighters had a height advantage over the escorting Spitfires and could use their dive and zoom tactics to perfection, which they did. And not only that, but then in August, along came the Focke Wolf 190, which was pretty much a quantum leap over a Spitfire and a 109. Um, and eventually the British Fighter High Command had to call the whole thing off in, uh, in June of 1942, but not before Britain had lost at least a thousand airmen, most of them into the channel. And the Germans had established a kill ratio of four to one. Wow. And it wasn't really until the back end of 1942, when the American Air Force started getting into their daylight bombing raids, that Germany started, the German Air Force started to become pushed onto the back foot. That's it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it was really, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that I don't think is really spoken about much. No, no, I bet it isn't. You don't, you don't hear about it much. Um, I mean, when I certainly read the brief for your book, I thought, what? You know, circus sorties where they're actually drawing, trying to draw the fighters. And I thought, how have I never heard of this? I mean, mm -hmm. Bomber Command is sort of, you know, my was my initial interest, but I'm trying to push myself more into the fighter side. I thought, mm -hmm. this is, I think, I think some of these sorties are probably overshadowed a bit by what happened with the Battle of Britain and then you know mm. them going further, Bomber Command going further into Germany and and that as well. But yeah, um really, really was interesting to read. Um I'm I'm really looking forward to actually reading this book. Well it did, uh, to me the most um what really got me into this was um many years ago in the 70s I bought a book which I still have called The Power to Fly by LJK Setrice, um, who was a, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he was a terrific uh, writer, technician, um, very interesting man. Now this book was about the development of piston engines, uh, piston yeah. aero engines, and he wrote one piece which really caught my eye, and he said, by 1943, nearly all the good pilots of the RAF had gone. They had been replaced by uh, badly trained, insufficiently tutored uh, men. And I thought, wow, is that true? And of course he was right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. I mean, when you think of certainly a lot of the pilots who perhaps were training pre-war, even into the early stages of the war, you know, even into 1943, they had a lot of experience under their belt. But Absolutely. then, you know, when you look at, I mean, even when you look at some of the books, you know, of the losses, when you get into 1943, the amount of losses that you're seeing as something mm. else. Um, and that's, you know, you've got, you're losing all that experience. You're now getting new guys, which, okay, they go through the training, but you're still learning on the job as well. Um, I've, things that, okay, things that turned up uh, in reading and researching. Um, in 19, at the back end of 1940, desperate times, of course, with the Battle of Britain, um, average hours for an RAF pilot in training were between 130 and 150. The operational training units didn't really get going until the end of 1940. Yeah. And um, at that time, a German pilot would have undertaken at least 240 hours of training before being given instruction in tactics and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, um, have you ever read Wing Leader by Johnny Johnson? No, I haven't. Oh, I, it, terrific. Very good. He says that when he went to an operational training unit at Hawarden at the back end of 1940, the officers who were training them were, of course, ex-fighter pilots. Yeah. And they didn't want to mix with a bunch of new boys, so they stuck to themselves and didn't impart the knowledge that they need the new people needed 
and he he wrote a wonderful piece saying what happened when Spitfire met Messerschmitt you know what were we supposed to do no one told us mm -hmm. he he never fired his guns until uh, his first combat yeah. um I, I, I mean the, the uh, I suppose you'd say the with the amount of uh, muddle and rush just to get people into aircraft left out some pretty vital things yeah because you go into an aircraft and you're out in your first stop and then what a shock to the system if that's the first time that you've actually fired that gun mm, absolutely and i mean the the raf also had uh, bad tactics i mean bad formations uh, everyone trying to keep formation with one another instead of looking for where the enemy is mm -hmm. and of course the germans had fought through the spanish civil war poland france the battle of britain they knew what they were doing mm -hmm. that's crazy that's crazy and i mean i can't believe as well when you're the likes of you're going to the training units or the otus and then you think I mean, if you go to a new job and you spend lunch times or you socialise with the people that you work with, you talk about your work, you learn just through conversation, things that you perhaps didn't know about that trade or that industry or, you know, so, so these guys, yeah, you know, they could have been passing so much information on to these no, they, stuck, they stuck at one end of the bar away from the newbies. Mm yes and uh, who is it said uh, johnny kent wing commander johnny kent a new zealander he uh, he recounted a couple of very interesting things one was that uh he, again and back in the 1940 uh he'd never fired his guns in anger at the operational training unit and begged the commanding officer for a go so finally the commanding officer said okay take that spitfire over there and go and shoot at the sea or something like that right yeah. so he said, so he said i fired and after a second the guns jammed so i i flew home and complained to the commanding officer and he said oh they didn't jam you ran out of ammunition that's all we can spare <laughs> well and, yeah, yeah but you know it's and i mean it's funny i go to a squadron reunion every year and we stay in the hotel that the air crew would have drank in for the raf base but you know there was a pub down the road and that's where the ground crew drank and, yes. and the officers. Oh. So, I mean, even when it came to actually being out on a base, they yes. all were in separate camps, so to speak. An, an officer's mess and an NCO's mess. And if you were a sergeant pilot, you didn't mix yeah. with the officers. You know, and, I, if you, and if you've got time off and you're in the pub, it's exactly the same. <laughs> there was a, the, the, the one piece of, there was one piece about Johnny Kent. Um, when he said that he and uh, several other wing commanders and nobody below wing commander rank and so forth attended a conference with um uh trafford lee mallory presiding uh at the back end of 1940 to talk about uh, the back end of 1941 to talk about uh, the makeup of the circuses that were going over and how better to do it etc and at the end of it, Lee Mallory said, well, anybody got any questions? So Kent put his hand up and said, look, if we're seriously going to damage the Germans, we're going to need a lot more than six medium bombers that we're escorting with 60 Spitfires. And if the intention is to bring up the Germans, we need some better tactics because they're killing us. Yeah. And, um, and he said, Lee Mallory looked a bit taken aback and asked Victor Beamish, a, a group captain who was also a fighter pilot, about his opinion and Beamy said well Kent is right sir so Lee Mallory looking round further found a group captain on his staff who didn't go on operations and said well what do you think and the chap said well we've done it sir we're successful and he said and Kent said I started to argue with him to no avail but we still kept sending men to Lille who I lost for no good reason yeah yeah I think that sort of uh, sums it up, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for speaking to me today, John. I will share the link um, of where you can buy John's book on the, the website and in the chat box as well. Thank you so much, John. And keep in touch if you've got any books coming out in the future. I would love to have you back. Well, thank you very much, Claire. It's been a delight. Thank you.
take here. Um, yeah, thanks to John. Um, I'm just going to give me just a second. I'm just going to place the details of. I was just going to say to Dan that little comment you made there, Dan, and from what Claire said about Pocklington, uh, the officers drank in the uh, feathers, and the ground crew drank in the the black ball. But at the end of an op uh, an operational tour, the crew once they had allocated aircraft for the ground crew. They used to all go to the station hotel. That was where they mixed together completely. But the story about them changing uh, tunics and uniforms is absolutely true. That did happen. Harry Hughes uh, detailed that to us a couple of times, one of our veterans. So, yeah, yeah, it was interesting um, how they got around the uh, snobbery. I know, and it's like whenever we come to the reunions, I'm always that bit scared to uh, <laughs> go in a, go somewhere that I shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Given we, that Balco was aircrew, we'll we'll not get into that, Claire. I don't think. No. no. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I've put some details into the chat box. I, another link for Dan for the for the the digital archive for the IBCC digital archive. Um, we've put some details for John Starkey, the link to John Starkey's book, which I've actually just ordered today and it's on special offer uh, at five pounds off at the moment. I've ordered that and I actually ordered um, Johnny Johnson's wing leader book today as well. Um, let me just run through some details for next month's webinar. Um, Yep, so next month's webinar is on Wednesday the 26th of April at 7pm. The speaker will be Dave Nelson, who will provide a presentation. Um, and it has, the title of that is An Example of a US Air Force Heavy Bomber Airfield in World War II Suffolk. Dave has been researching B-17s, the 390th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force and their base at RAF Framlington on and off since 19, the 1980s. He renewed his interest after returning to college and attaining a degree in history. He will be presenting the story of the base, a city in itself, yet integral to its surroundings. Home to 3,000 young men, some facing the jarring horrors of combat, while others the routine slog of daily routine. He'll talk about how they trained, worked and lived, and what their days were like, um, and how it all worked as well. An amalgamation of a cross section of America's youth, unfamiliar with their often very specialised tasks, tasks, managed to take it all function from cutting edge combat and aviation technology to utilities and mail services. Uh, I must admit that I am really excited about Dave's presentation. Um, and also next month we've got a short interview with John Sweetman in relation to his book, The Dam Busters, Was It Worthwhile? This, his book's actually just come out in time for the 80th anniversary of the Dam Buster Raids. Um, and he was an amazing guy to talk to. Um, I think when he said to me that he remembered the Dam Busters Raids, that sort of took me aback. Um, so you can listen to his recording as well. Um, before we actually sign off, I've, I've put the link into the chat box. If you want to sign up for next month's webinar, you can click on that now and register. Uh, we're always happy to collaborate, so if anyone um, has a project or is publishing a book or has something that they'd like to share with our audience, please get in touch. Um, alternatively, if you're struggling with your own research, feel free to reach out via our website and details are in the chat box. And for anyone who's watching via YouTube, I will update the details on there as well. Dan, I managed to find this collection that I've recently bought. So it's a set of um, birthday cards. They're about little postcards. Mm -hmm. And I have about eight of them. So it's basically the, the date on one of them says November 45. And when I bought them, I was told that I think it was something that was actually published on the air bases. Um, and they actually would put the name in and they would put what birthday it was and it's sort of in the RAF colours, but I've also, it came with a, a photograph. 
doesn't have any squadron details, doesn't tell me where it is. I do have some names um, on the postcards, and I know it was Chrissy's birthday, um, but nothing to indicate where it is, or which <laughs> is really annoying, really annoying. So that was one of the, the purchases I bought in a, a little military shop in Glasgow when I was there recently. Uh -huh. I go in and I say, what Air Force things have you got? And that's um, that's what they had. So I thought, well, yeah, that's quite interesting. I'll take that. <laughs> have you ever seen anything like that before? No, I haven't. No, the, the photographs, loads of things like that. Yeah, but no, not those. That's, uh, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I need to research it more about yeah. and find out, yeah, was it something perhaps near the base or on a base that they would do for our celebrations? Yeah. Not not a clue. That's not not something I've I've come across before. No. no. Interesting. I'll I'll keep you posted if I find out more. <laughs> uh, so thanks again, Dan, for your presentation. It was really informative. Pleasure. I hope it's I uh, hope it's helped people. And yeah, if it's on YouTube, we can send people yeah. that way when uh, they when they've done the thing where they put in flight lieutenant Smith and get five thousand hits. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. I'll send you the link on anyway, and I look forward to catching up again soon. Wizard, thank you. Okay, thanks everyone for attending, and we look forward to seeing all of you next month as well. Take care.